do 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 right we're off so third and final of the night and um, this one I've been very very lucky in well A to get it uh, and B that um, I don't actually need to do any research for this because it's all on the box bonus um, so this is one that I actually have the bottle of because it's this one um, it's the New Zealand whiskey collection double wood and um, the reason I have this is that my aunt um, lives over in New Zealand and uh, married a guy from there um, so they've lived over there for several years quite a long time maybe 15 years I think she's been living out there um, and a couple ooh, we're looking about two years ago I think maybe maybe not even as long as that um, they came they come over every now and again to see us normally at Christmas um, do a lot of traveling and they, they come across and, and see us and sort of stick around for a week or so and we go across and meet them for dinner and all this lot and um, at one point in time I think it might have even been for a Christmas present so probably two Christmases ago um, I ended up getting this as a uh, present from them very very kindly so um, I have covered a New Zealand whiskey before um, because there has only ever been one distillery on the island um, which was uh, the <laughs> it's known as uh, Dunedin Distillery uh, the Willowbank Distillery um, there's also Lamalor, which were the peated versions um, and then Milford uh, it's been known as the Milford Distillery and Milford was the one I had and looking back in my videos that was actually dram number 18 I did Milford um, which was a donation from um, Chris and Lindsay Cook so um, I did the information and I did the, the notes and did the research and did all about you know Milford and Dunedin and everything like that and I had this in my possession and it turns out the box which looks like this has got all the bloody information on it already so all I'm going to do is read you what's on the box because it's actually pretty good and pretty comprehensive so um, whiskey distilling New Zealand was born with the arrival of Scottish settlers in the 1830s okay many Scots settled in the Otago region and the industry flourished here until the 1870s when onerous government regulations effectively shut it down bloody government eh? bastard politicians uh, a distilling industry gradually re-emerged in the 1950s and in 1974 the Baker, Fala the Baker family opened the Willowbank Distillery in Dunedin, which is here, um, and apparently, reading somewhere else, um, they basically appealed to the government and said, look, you really need to chill out a bit, you know, this, this will actually help business, um, it, it's commerce, everything like that, it's well worth letting us do this, so come on, you know, pull your finger out, and uh, legislations were changed to enable them to do this distillery. So it produced uh, popular whiskies such as Wilson's and 45 South. Now, I actually have a litre bottle of Wilson's, which is the blended whiskey, which used um, uh, whiskey from the Willowbank. I've not opened it. It was a uh, leaving present when I left the whiskey shop. And um, the people, the couple that gave it to me, the husband I know has passed away, sadly. Uh, and I've been very, very reluctant to open it. I kept it aside. I didn't want to open it for the challenge. Plus, this is... A better expression, so we say, than, than the Wilsons that I've got. So the world's largest distiller, Seagram's of Canada, maybe at the time actually, because it's Diageo now, if you were calling it the largest distiller, bit of an odd terminology that, and that's one of those things that you need to be careful of when you're reading packaging. The world's largest distiller, Seagram's of Canada, not true now, and what is the world's largest distiller? It's kind of like, well, it's not distillery distiller because they own a number of companies. Anyway, they bought Willowbank in the 1980s. The distillery thrived under Seagram's and its single malt Lamalor, named after a nearby Rantum range, was highly regarded around the world. Now Lamalor was the peated version of anything out of Willowbank. There was Milford which was the unpeated versions and Lamalor was all the peated ones. But in 1987 Seagram sold Willowbank to the Australian brewer Foster's which if you're in the UK you've definitely heard of only for them to close the distillery and sell the remaining barrel stocks over time. So in 1997, uh, in fact, it was um, 1997 they bought it and then it closed in, because I did write this down, oops, sorry, sorry for doing that, it closed in, dun, 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 bear with me, it was mothballed and then I think it was 2001. Um, so the stills themselves were actually sent to Fiji to produce rum. So there is no distillery, there's not even any chance of it reopening again because they actually shipped the stills to Fiji for rum production. So the New Zealand Whiskey Company um, was set up and they bought the last 80,000 litres of cash strength whiskey in 443 barrels. 
The whiskey's been quietly maturing in the Taran Seaside Bond Store in Oumaru's famous heritage precinct ever since. Um, so yes, that's just nonsense at the bottom. Um, distilled legendary Dunedin Distillery, because again, they're calling it the Dunedin Distillery and Willowbank on the same freaking packaging. Um, Snow melt from the Southern Alps, filtered naturally through the Great Moss Swamp, blah, 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 yeah, whatever. So, what is also interesting on the label is, now this is a blended whiskey. Um, this is a combination of, it's a 15 year old at 40%, um, and it's a blended whiskey of, um, it was, it's, it's New Zealand grain whiskey and then malt whiskey from the Willow Bank. Um, initially aged in American oak ex burble bar uh, burble? bourbon barrels, and finished, finished, right, this is a 15 year old, Finished normally implies six months, a year, and a 15 year old probably two years at the most. Finished for over 10 years in French oak ex New Zealand red wine casks. That's not really a finish when it's 10 years of the 15. Okay, it's the last 10 years, but that's that's a finish and a half. So it's quite a lot of maturation. Now, it is open. I have had a couple of um, shots of it ages ago. To be perfectly honest, I can't even remember what it was like. So I am coming to this fairly fresh because I honestly, <laughs> I think I seem to recall it was pretty, pretty okay, but it didn't rock my socks off. But I'm looking at this in a completely fresh light, having done 351, 351? Yeah, 351 um, whiskies prior to this one. So we shall see how it goes. So, um, Steve and Charlotte, thank you very much for this in the unlikely event that you are actually watching this. And let's see how we get on with this. Now, I'm fairly certain colour has not been added because I don't think they would do this, but you can tell instantly from the bottle, let alone me holding up the glass, that is a deep, dark colour. Um, and I think that's a predominantly red wine casks. Now, red wine casks are... I've come across red wine casks, um, red wine matured or finished whiskey, and to me it's very, very hit and miss. Because if you get the right red wine cask, where it's got that sweetness to it, it can be absolutely fantastic on whiskey. But if you get, a, you know, Pinot Noir tends to work really well. But if you get a red wine cask that it's, it's, it can be just too dry and too tannic, um, you know, almost as though it's something like. Um, Syrah, Shiraz, both the same thing. Syrah, Shiraz, or uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. I've had a Cabernet Sauvignon finish where it was actually worked out quite nicely, but I've had a couple more where it's, it's just been too dry and you get that red wine tannic effect where it sucks all the moisture out of your mouth and then ends up being quite, almost like, eh, I need, I need some water or something. It just doesn't work with sort of the maltiness of a whiskey or anything like that. So. We'll see how this goes, but like I say, this is a blended whiskey. This is a combination of grain and single malt whiskey, all from New Zealand. It's 100% New Zealand, but it's not uh, New Zealand single malt. Essentially, they're blending it because then it gives them more bottles to play with because they've got a finite quantity of this. There is nothing left, no more zip. There are rumours, I believe that there may even be some operations, where there is some New Zealand um, distilleries that are there. I think there are some actually, from my recollections way back when I did the, um, the Milford, is that there are about three or four very, very small scale distilleries operating now in New Zealand. Um, but the New Zealand Whiskey Company have, well at the time, 443 when they bought it. So you sort of... You know, you want to keep some to get some really aged ones. You know, you imagine a 30 year old New Zealand whiskey is, is going to fetch a pretty price. You've got to look at this as a business as well in terms of, right, we've paid for this stock. We've got to wait for it. We've got to do what we can for it. Some of it we're going to have to sit on for donkey's years before we can release it. And then we need to make a profit because you've got to make a profit on this as well. They're not just doing it out of the goodness of our own heart. So if you can do it as a blended you've got, you can make more bottles out of the stock that you've got because you can dilute it for want of a better word with some other stock you can do other things with it because you do, you're going to want to get a 30 year old you're going to want to get a 40 year old new zealand whiskey and it will cost an absolute bomb but they'll make their money back that way so let's see how we go with this And actually on the nose, you get that slightly tannic, slightly dry effect of a red wine. There, yeah, there is. There's a dry spiciness, but it's, it's the spice. It's not the spiciness of, say, the rye of the millstone. It's the spiciness of a spicy red wine character. It's slightly, um, 
It's almost like green pepper and peppercorns. It's, it's a peppery red wine character. It, I'd love to know rot, what, rot, what uh, red wine cask it was because just on the nose, I get the impression it's something like Cabernet Sauvignon. Something like that, that drier, spicier, maybe Merlot, something like that, where it's it's a slightly, it's got a slight spiciness to it. It's got a kind of peppery, green pepper element to it as well. It's It, it doesn't nose like it's a sweeter red wine, you know, erring towards the port side of things. Oh, there's a big red wine influence on that. And again, it's the dryness. It's not too bad, but there is such an obvious red wine characteristic to this. It's unbelievable. It really is. Now it's released at 40% as well. Again, release it at 40%. You've got more bottles that you can fill at 40% than you have releasing it at cash strength. Be interesting to see what that was like at cash strength though. But 10 years is a long time to be sitting in a cask that's previously had red wine in, and it picks up a lot of the characteristics. And I don't mind red wine. I'm not a massive red wine drinker. I'm not a massive wine drinker full stop, particularly since I've been doing the challenge. Any occasional glass of wine that I've had, and I used to love wine. I used to work for Oddbins, absolutely loved it, was mad about wine and whiskey. And my passion for wine has somewhat diminished. And I've become less enthusiastic about just wine in general. And even, you know, red wine more so than white wine. White wine I'm okay with. Red wine I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with at times, particularly the drier, spicier side of it. Um, and, and that's what this characteristic is that's in this whiskey. It's that drier, spicier type of red wine that really comes through. Now, it, it kind of works. And I think there are people out there that would really love this, that would love the whiny character that's through there. But it's just, it's too, it's too dry for me. It's too tannic. And it really is less whiskey and more red wine. It, it's almost like you've had a glass of red wine and then you've poured whiskey into it. I can't even remember which one it was when, and it, was, it wasn't that long ago where it, I, I described the flavor profile as you've had a, um, a, a drink of beer and, and then you've added some whiskey in, but it's still got the dregs. And this is like you poured a whiskey in that's had, you, you've already got like a little bit of red wine in the bottom and the, the two have just kind of like melded together. It, it's got that characteristic of, uh, you know, you've, you've added a little bit of, like I say, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, something like that, just a few drops into it, as opposed to water, and gone, oh, I like red wine, and I like whiskey. Actually, I'll see what the two are like if you put them together, and it's like that, and you would probably love it, because it's not that it's unbalanced. I'll be honest, it, 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 the, the balance of flavors, and the progression of flavors all the way through, isn't actually that bad. It's just because I'm not a big fan of dry red, red wine, that this isn't really floating my boat. But if you do like dry red wine, and you do like whiskey, I think that this really would rock your world. I, I really do. I think it would be, it's very drinkable. It doesn't have much of a kick to it. It's very well balanced. It's, it's actually quite, it's got a good mouthfeel to it. There's no harshness. It's balanced very well. It's just me personally. There's just too much of a dry red wine character to it. But I, th I honestly think there are people out there that are going to absolutely love this. I really do. And fair play to me. Because if that's the sort of thing that you like, that's the sort of thing you like. Right, that's me done. Um, I need to do some washing up because I've got lots of uh, mucky glasses now. And I shall see you at the next one. Cheers.